ready, the finest submarine in the world. She is powered by nuclear engines, packed with electronic gear worth millions, manned by the most carefully selected crew in submarine history. She looks a lot different from the stubby two-masted Holland that was our first submarine back in 1900. Now there was a miracle. At first, we weren't quite sure when she submerged that we'd ever see her again, but her crew was. We worked on her, tinkered with the diving gear, gradually developed an improved boat that showed the Germans they had no monopoly on submarine construction. In 1917, the submarine force was battling public opinion as well as the enemy. Folks thought submarines were unchivalrous, that war under the sea was unfair and inhuman. But we kept on working. If we'd paid much attention to these emotional protests, we wouldn't have had that old but tough S-boat and the long-range fleet types that made up our small submarine force in 1941. When all the training of 25 peaceful years was suddenly put to the test, The small submarine force based at Pearl Harbor was not attacked, a mistake that soon had the Japanese wishing they had been a little more thorough. For during the next three and a half years, American submarines proceeded to wreck the Japanese dream of empire. They received their assignment, cut the supply lines, sink the ships. We had torpedo troubles too, but eventually solved them. We developed an electric weightless torpedo that proved almost undetectable on its way to the target. The submarines became more efficient, quieter, stronger, deeper diving, and were fitted with better radar and sonar. During training, the crews had been welded into perfectly synchronized teams. In combat, they proved to be fighting units second to none. They sank 1,178 Japanese merchant ships, 214 Japanese combat vessels, two-thirds of their merchant fleet, one-third of their navy. Two hundred and eighty-eight American submarine crews had carried out the assignment, cut the supply line, sink the ships. So the war ended, but interest in the submarine service continued. Hundreds of men apply yearly for submarine training. They are drawn by the camaraderie of the service. Extra pay, best food in the Navy, and pride in the achievements of the submarine force. The junior officer welcomes responsibilities usually reserved for his seniors, including the possibility of early command. Applicants are screened three times. First, for physical fitness, including 20-20 vision. Then, for intelligence and fast reaction time. The lives of 80 men may depend on the quick and proper closing of a hatch or valve. There's no room for a mistake. The third screening is by Navy psychologists for social adaptability. The easygoing, steady sailor fits best into the crowded conditions peculiar to submarine operation. Only one out of five applicants qualifies for the submarine school at New London. During the two months enlisted course and the six months officer's course, each man must acquire a working knowledge of each department of the submarine. The men study communications. In engineering classes, they become familiar with both the diesel and the battery propulsion system. They learn to load and fire torpedoes. They study damage control and how to save a crippled ship. 
They learn how to dive their submarine, to take her down in less than a minute. Here is a cross-section of a submarine about midships, with the U-shaped ballast tanks around the inner pressure hull. The tanks are open to the sea, but do not fill with water because they are full of air. To submerge, the air vents at the top of the tanks are opened, releasing the air and permitting water to rush in at the bottom, and the submarine submerges. Surfacing reverses the process. The tank vents are closed, and compressed air is let in at the top. This forces the water out and lightens the submarine so that it surfaces. Drills at sea put the students' classroom studies into practice. Let up in, dive, dive! <laughs> The green lights on the board show that all hull openings are closed. A slight air pressure has been built up in the boat as a double check. One five zero feet. One five zero feet, I. One five zero feet. One five zero. Ten degrees down, Angus. Ten degrees down. Low negative to the mark. Good air. The diving officer is getting rid of negative buoyancy so he can level off at one five zero feet. No more, no less. The bow and stern planes, which control the angle of dive, stop the boat's descent and level her off. Easy angle. Easy angle. At the school, the student has another type of test, an ascent through 100 feet of water to demonstrate his knowledge of survival techniques. At last, the day of graduation comes. The submariner is ordered to his new home, a boat, not a ship, to the men who man her. And a new life begins. What type of duty does the new submariner draw? He may join a radar picket boat like the Spinnix. Her job is a lonely station far off the American coast, maintaining a round-the-clock watch for surprise prowlers. Her detection gear never rests. Her job is never done. Perhaps he will go to a guided missile launcher like the Tunney. He will learn during maneuvers the capabilities of this newest weapon of the Navy. The new submariner may be ordered to a hunter-killer. This new submarine class is specially designed to meet the threat of an enemy undersea fleet. Probing the depths with its sonar gear, the hunter-killer can seek and destroy the enemy submarine in its own element. The deep water sailor may take an active part in tests of hull construction, endurance, strength. The submariner may go to a troop-carrying submarine, like the Perch. She carries a hangar on her deck for amphibious boats, or a helicopter for reconnaissance. Inside, She's crowded with extra bunks for underwater demolition teams or reconnaissance parties. Perch and others of her class are especially suited for work preceding invasion or surprise raids on lonely enemy installations. Perch participated in a commando raid during the Korean War, putting a party of British Marines ashore for a special mission, destruction of a railroad. Score, 100%. The 
with only one casualty, the commandos were soon back on board the waiting submarine to make their report and head for home. Since the war, the sturdy fleet submarine has acquired a new look. She's been streamlined, the deck gun removed, and her deck gear housed in a sleek superstructure. Many submarines have been equipped with the snorkel, an air intake and exhaust device, which permits the submarine to run on her diesels and recharge her batteries without surfacing. Yes, there have been many developments in the ever-changing design and structure of the underwater arm of the Navy. The development of the atomic bomb brought new problems and challenges to the Navy. Most immediate of these was the harnessing of this tremendous power to a ship's propulsion system. The climax of nine years of atomic engineering came in January of 1954 with the launching of the nuclear submarine Nautilus. Within the smooth cylinder of her hull is housed the most amazing machinery in the world, an atomic reactor capable of generating propulsive power. She needs no batteries or diesel engines. She is equipped with gear for purifying and reusing air, making her nearly independent of the surface. The time she can remain submerged is limited only by her food storage capacity and her crew's endurance. Speakers at the launching ceremony included the Chief of Naval Operations, who predicted a brilliant future for this boat. As a sailor, I recognize this ship as the beginning of a new chapter in the history of sea power. Then the President's lady sent her down the way. So, a new era arrived, the era of atomic propulsion. With the commissioning ceremonies, the Nautilus officially became the first nuclear-powered vessel of the United States Navy, or for that matter, of any Navy. But to the men of the silent service, the men who go down to the sea and under it, she is more than a new era. She is their boat. She is Nautilus queen of the seas, and she and her sisters will keep those seas safe for freedom.